What we're going to take a look at in these first 19 verses of John chapter 12 is we're going to look at two significant events. And I'm going to really need your participation during this message. In this way, you really need to picture what's going on. I mean, these things really happened. So I just want you to, to, to make, use a little holy imagination and just really think about what it was like at these two scenes that we're going to look at here in the first 19 verses. Ready for this? Starting out verse 1, we read, Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. All right, John gives us a time marker in verse 1. He says it's six days before the Passover. Now, that wasn't just any Passover in the life of Jesus. This was the Passover that Jesus was going to be crucified at that festival, at that holiday. So what you have, in a sense, is you have a time marker telling us that this is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. In the next seven days, he's going to have his last week in Jerusalem and then be betrayed, be crucified, and rise from the dead. Friends, we're at the seven-day marker for the last seven days of the ministry of Jesus. And what I want you to notice is something is if you take a look at the Gospel of John, the entire Gospel of John takes 22 chapters, and we've just finished chapter 11. This tells us, and it's not just by the chapters, but by the verse count as well, John spends almost 50% of his gospel on the last seven days of Jesus' life. Doesn't that strike you as just a little bit strange? I mean, Jesus' ministry was more than three years in its length. His life was 33 years long. Yet John, in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, spends 50% of his book talking about the last seven days of Jesus' life. And the other gospels are similar. Uh, the gospel of Matthew, I believe, spends something like 40% of, excuse me, Matthew uses about 30% of his gospel, Mark nearly 40%, and Luke about 25% of their gospels, all describing the last seven days of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Do you think that the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us something? Friends, these are the most important seven days in the history of the world ever. And, and I'm not just saying that the way that a speaker might make an exaggerated statement for effect. No, I mean that. I mean that what happened in these seven days has influenced humanity and will influence the universe more than any other seven days that have existed. It's worth our time. It's worth our attention. And it all begins with a dinner party in Bethany. Did you notice that in the first few verses that I read to you? There they are having a dinner party. Now you know what it's like to invite people over to your home for dinner. You know what it's like to go over to somebody else's house for dinner. And there they are gathered together. Verse 2 says... There they made him a supper. It's in the village of Bethany, which is right outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus is there. We know from some of the other Gospels that it was held at the home of a man known as Simon the leper. Actually, it was Simon the former leper, but they still called him Simon the leper. I don't know if he was happy or sad about that. But they called him Simon the leper because Jesus healed him from his leprosy. He had the house at which it was held. And then we also have three other notable people there. Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. By the way, it seems to indicate that this dinner was a celebration of Lazarus being raised from the dead. It's kind of like, yes, it's, well, it's almost like a wake in reverse. Instead of having the party, you know, regarding somebody's passing, here it is the party that they come back from the dead. So you got Lazarus there. You got Lazarus' sister Mary. And you got Lazarus' other sister Martha. Those three people... You have Jesus, of course, you have Simon the leper, and a collection of other people from the village. Now, one thing we note about this, and look at verse 2, it tells us that Martha served. I can't tell you we know exactly what the guest list was for this particular dinner held in the honor of Lazarus and Jesus. But if it was according to ancient custom, and we would assume that it was, we don't know for sure, if it was according to ancient custom... It was only the men who were eating. Martha and the other women were serving the men. The men of the village of Bethany were having their little feast. And what's Martha doing? She's serving. Now, I don't know about you, but as I picture this scene in my mind, I picture Martha happy in her service. She's happy to be serving Jesus. 
Can you just picture Martha saying, okay, we just got this, this plate ready from the kitchen. It's ready to go. This looks like a good one. Jesus is getting this first. Don't you think that's how it would work? Don't you see Martha hovering over Jesus saying, eat some more, eat some more, have some more. Do you have people like that in your life? I've got a mother-in-law, dear mother-in-law in in Sweden. And that's what it's like, man, when I eat at her house. It's eat some more, eat some more. Don't you see Martha loving on Jesus, doting upon him, serving him in a wonderful way at this dinner party? Now, why do I bring that up? Why, why, Why do I bring it up just over two words in the text that say Martha served? Friends, I want to bring it up in this way. In a few moments, I'm going to talk a lot about Martha's sister, Mary, and what an amazing person Mary was. But when we look at Mary, we look at somebody who is very spiritually inclined. Her spirit just soars with the things of the spirit very easily. She's just lifted up on the wings and on the winds of the spirit. She's locked in and it's just, you know, just the singing of a bird and she's worshiping God. You know, that kind of attitude with Mary. Martha seems very different. Martha seems like a very practical woman. And believe me, friends, I think that Martha loved Jesus just as much as Mary, but sometimes when you're a more practically oriented person, it's hard for you to feel that way. Isn't it true that a lot of times practically oriented people feel inferior at church? They feel like, well, listen, you know, everybody else, as soon as the first chord of the guitar is strummed, oh, they're all worshiping the Lord. Man, it takes me about three songs before my heart gets into it. No, I, listen, do not feel despised among the people of God. God loves Martha just as much as he loves Mary. Let, let, let me just sort of give you a principle here. The principle is this. Spiritual things come more easily for some people but everybody can serve Jesus. If you're a person for whom spiritual things don't come as easily, don't despise that, but realize, oh, God has a wonderful place for you in his plan, in his kingdom. You're a Martha, then be the very best Martha among God's people and in his kingdom that you can be. And if you're a Mary, well, then do the Mary thing, like we're gonna see her do. Look here at verse three. Verse three, then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Do you have the scene here? All right, if I was a little bit more acrobatic as a preacher, I'd be acting all this out. But do you understand how they ate in that day? They didn't sit at a table on a chair with their feet under the table. They would lay up to the table. The table would be like a low coffee table in front of them. They would sort of rest on one arm and maybe on this one so that they could eat with their right hand, lay on some pillows, and their feet would go down behind them, laying down on a low cushion at a low table. The food's in front of them. They just kind of relax and kick back. And eating while you're laying down, that sounds pretty cool to me. (laughs) That was just their custom. In the midst of the dinner, Martha's serving, everybody's enjoying, everybody's talking. Mary does something. The friends, we just got to shake the religious cobwebs out of our head. This was weird. It was a bizarre interruption to the dinner to have Mary come along, come behind Jesus with his legs laying, you know, away from the table, to come up to the feet of Jesus and take out a bottle, something like this much, a little bit less than an entire bottle of water, a very expensive perfume, very expensive. Open up the bottle, pour out the whole, but top's on, you didn't think it was gonna pour out, did you? (laughs) Pour out the whole bottle over the feet of Jesus, and then, instead of logically having a towel or something with you, or, or even using your garment, She takes down her hair, which would have been up like a proper Jewish lady. She takes down her hair, which would have been long because they never cut it. She takes her hair and she starts wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair. Now you and I, we get all these religious cobwebs in our mind. We read down the Bible, oh yeah, yeah, she did that. Friends, that's really weird. It's a really extreme thing to do. 
But Mary was being extreme in her love for Jesus. You know, if I think about it, I think first of all, what Mary did for Jesus was remarkably humble. What do I mean by that? Friends, she's washing his feet. That was the work that the lowest slave did in the house. And to wash the feet, it was a normal thing to do, but they did it when they came into the house. Mary said, no, Jesus, they they washed your feet when you came in. That's not good enough for you, Jesus. I'm going to act as if I'm the lowest slave in the house and the water that they washed your feet with, that's not good enough. Here's the most expensive perfume that I have and I'm going to pour it out at your feet. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to sit at your feet, Jesus, and take the place of the most humble slave and wash your feet. Secondly, Mary's gift was remarkably extreme. What do I mean by that? Friends, it would have been of note if she simply washed Jesus' feet with water. She took a large amount of a most expensive perfume. How expensive? Judas did the calculation and he said you could have sold that perfume for what was equivalent to a year's wages for a laboring man. That's a lot. Now you might say, why would they ever have such an expensive perfume? Friends, in those days, perfumes were often used as investments. They were small, they were portable, they could be easily sold. This might have been her dowry, her life investment. Who knows what it represented, but it was a substantial gift. And what did she do? Friends, if she would have poured out half the bottle, we would have gone, oh my, half the bottle, that's amazing. No, no half the bottle with Jesus. She empties it all, all upon Jesus. That's an extreme gift, extreme. Finally, Mary's gift was not only humble, it was not only extreme, but it was also unself-conscious. What do I mean by that? Look, we, we all have a sense of propriety when we express our love for Jesus, don't we? Mary seemed, in some sense, I, I hope you don't take this wrong, But Mary seemed in some sense to lose some of her sense of propriety in honoring Jesus. What do I mean by that? Friends, it was not proper for a Jewish lady to unbind her hair and let it all show it. They thought that the, 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 the flowing locks of a woman's unbound hair was like her glory and it was reserved for her husband's eyes only. That was the thinking. And they're like saying, what? You're doing what, Mary? All these men are eating dinner and you come in and you just let the locks flow and then very demonstrably you're going to wipe his feet with your hair? Get a towel. Mary didn't care. I don't know if it was planned. I don't know if it was spontaneous. But she just said, I'm going to be unselfconscious in the way that I love Jesus. Friends, isn't there something super admirable in the way that Mary loved Jesus? So humbly, so extremely, so unselfconsciously. It makes me say, I want to love Jesus that same way. And notice what else it says there in verse 3. It says that the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. John still remembered what it smelled like. It's as if he could close his eyes and breathe it in. And you know sometimes what a strong impression a sense of smell can make. She's like, he's like, I can still smell that oil filling the whole house with its fragrance. Now, we might think that the camera pans away at this point. We go, my, what a remarkable act of Mary to do this. And it was a remarkable act. But friends, it's not over. I want you to see what happens in the next verse, in verse 4. Check this out. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and used to take what was put in it. Okay, can we agree that when Mary did this, it was very awkward? I've had dinner with a lot of people. We've had a lot of people into our home. We've had dinner at a lot of people's homes. I've never had this happen. 
not, not at a dinner we've given or somebody's given for us. We've never had it happen. We're in the midst of dinner. You know, somebody comes and pours, you know, a huge bottle of expensive perfume over somebody's feet, wipes it with the hair and all that. This was awkward, friends. And you can imagine, uh, you know, somebody thinking, well, should I break the awkwardness of the situation? Lazarus is about to say, hey, how about those olives? Those are really good, aren't they? (laughs) Before Lazarus can say that, Judas, when he can't take it anymore, he's going to break the awkwardness of the situation. And Judas just simply says, he goes, whoa, wait a minute, folks. This is way out of bounds. Isn't this a little too much? Aren't we getting away with ourselves here? And then he throws down that trump card, right? The poor. Shouldn't have this been done for the poor? And Judas says, well, nobody can argue with that. I mean, God wants us to give to the poor, doesn't he? God wants us to be generous to people who are in need. And you can just sense the moral superiority that Judas is feeling and how strong he's feeling it. But friends, before we're talking about that, I just want to lay aside a principle. Can you get inside the scene here? I just want you to understand. Here's the principle. Generosity looks crazy to the greedy heart. Isn't that true? Don't you see Mary being so generous? And Judas, by the way, Matthew tells us that some of the other disciples agreed. They thought, yes, yeah, yeah, Judas, you got a point there, Judas. Good point, Judas. Her generosity looked crazy to other people. Look, I'll tell you this. And some of you, you, you understand biblical generosity. You understand what the Bible tells you about the way you should be generous with your resources. Some of you understand and get it, and you know this. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, but you know this. You know that other people think you are crazy for what you do. They say, what? That much? You give that much? To what? They're thinking. Look, don't let it throw you. True generosity always looks like something crazy to a greedy heart. That's how Judas saw this. Now, notice what it says there in verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. I wonder if Judas didn't see that bottle of super expensive perfume that Mary had, and he's doing the calculations, oh yeah, that's worth a lot of money. Man, if she gives that to the poor and works the money through me, I can skim a lot off the top. He's doing all those calculations. Therefore, when she pours it out over the feet of Jesus, how does Judas feel? It's a waste! But friends, that trump card about the poor that he tried to lay down, No, 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 no. His concern wasn't for the poor. His concern was for his own pocket. He was skimming off the top of the collective money of Jesus and the disciples. Jesus and the disciples were supported by some women and by some other people who donated to their needs. Judas kept that money in his charge, and Judas took money off the top, and he stole it. Matter of fact, it's even worse than that. Because the the chronology is a little bit under debate here, but we read uh, seemingly that according to Matthew and Luke, that it was right after this, right after this, that Judas said, I'm going to go to the priests and betray Jesus for money, for 30 pieces of silver. It's as if Judas is doing the calculation. I could have pocketed some of that money from the sale of the perfume. That didn't work out. How else can I get some money? I'll go to the priests and I'll betray Jesus. By the way, sometimes people like to try to find a kind motive in Judas's heart for betraying Jesus. This is the one you hear sometimes. They say, well, you know, Judas really believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He just wanted to force Jesus' hand and make him do that. You know? and, and so really he had a good motive, but he was just mixed up. Uh, friends, don't you believe that for a moment? The Bible gives one motive for what Judas did. And you know what that one motive was? Greed. He wanted the money. 
which astounds us and saddens us. Well, Judas wasn't able to do that, and Judas, Judas opened up in his mind, in his heart, I believe, through this greed and discontent, he opened up a foothold to the devil. And before you know it, the devil is using Judas to bring the Son of God before the religious authorities who will send him to the cross. Verse 7. I'm so happy Jesus answers here. Are you still at the dinner party in your mind? They're all eating. Mary does what she does. Judas says what he says. Now Jesus is going to have the last word. Ready for this? Verse 7. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always. But me, you do not have always with you. See what Jesus is saying? Saying, guys, if this were a funeral, we wouldn't be quibbling over the bill. Have you ever been to a funeral, a memorial sometime? You see the coffin. You see all the flowers. You see all the, you know, place, fancy place. Have, have you ever done that? And you go, man, this was a lot of money. Man, I, they might have been able to do something better with that money. Now, maybe you've thought that. I don't think a single one of you, some of you as messed up as some of you are, I don't think a single one of you has ever stood up in the midst of a funeral and said, you know, this is all a little much, isn't it? Couldn't we give this money to something better than this? No, you, you understand that even if you think it, you'd never say it, would you? Friends, Judas said it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, if I were dead and she poured out this precious perfume on my body, not a single person among you would question this expense. You would think it was something honorable. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not dead, but in a week I will be. And how appropriate is it for Mary to do this now when I can appreciate it? When it can communicate it so eloquently to others? Judas, how dare you say this? I love what Jesus said in verse 7. Let her alone. Leave her alone. Don't do anything about it. You let her alone. Back off, Judas. Now, she has done this for the day of my burial my death is on the way, and she honored me in this. Now we pick it up at the next verse, verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. All right, did you understand what I just read to you there from those verses? First of all, it says that there were a lot of people who stopped by just to look in at the dinner. You know, they poked their head in the door. This is a village culture. I mean, people just do that in that culture. You, you don't live behind walls so much. Everybody kind of has an open house. And so even if you're not invited to the dinner, you don't mind sticking your head in the door and going, wow, who's eating over there? <laughs> what? That's Lazarus. I thought he was dead. No, Jesus was dead. Look, he could actually eat. He really is alive. They're not just setting up a mannequin or a corpse there at the table. He's alive. Lazarus is really risen from the dead. And it attracted a lot of attention. This was a big deal that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And everybody took note of it. That's the first thing to note. The second thing to note in those verses that I just read, the religious authorities said, Lazarus has to die. Do you understand what's going on here? Lazarus was irrefutable evidence of the power of Jesus to change a life and to bring life to what was dead. And people hated him because he was irrefutable evidence of that. Friends, do, do I have to reach very far to draw a spiritual principle from that? If your life bears the marks of Jesus' work, if people can look at your life and say, man, Jesus did something in that guy. Huh, look at her. Jesus really changed her life. There will be some people, I hope it's few, but there will be some people who hate you because of that. Can I just tell you something? Don't take it personal. It's not so much that they don't like you. They don't like the Jesus that changed your life. 
and your life produces irrefutable evidence that Jesus has the power and the love to change lives today. So what do they say? Kill Lazarus, which by the way was kind of knuckleheaded. What, why are you going to try to kill a guy that Jesus can just raise from the dead again? <laughs> but that's the way they're thinking. They're not thinking clearly, are they? All right, the camera's going to fade on our first scene. I said you need to visualize two scenes here going on. One was the dinner party in Bethany. Okay, we're done with that. Now the second scene is when Jesus enters in triumph to Jerusalem. John states it very sort of succinctly in just a few verses. Let's look at it here starting at verse 12. Ready for this? The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. So the next day, the day after the feast at Bethany, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Now, Bethany was not very far from Jerusalem. So Jesus is making the short journey. But friends, there's a lot of people around. There's a lot of people because, as John mentions here in verse 12, a great multitude. Why? Well, because thousands upon thousands of people came to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. They came because it was commanded. They came because it was a tremendous party. And they came because, well, it was just the thing to do. And so they're all gathered there together, thousands upon thousands of people. So can you picture that scene in your mind? There's Jesus walking in, and they're waving palm branches. You get that? There's Jesus walking in. They're crying out, Hosanna, uh, save now. Uh, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the king of Israel. Do you see that as well? Do you see Jesus riding on a donkey, coming in, everybody's celebrating. I don't know if it's hundreds of people. I don't know if it's thousands of people. Do you have that scene in your mind? All right, good. I see a few nodding heads. Yes, you do. All right, now, you got that scene in your mind? I want you to add something to that scene that you've never added to before. At least I never had. Maybe you have, but I never had. Here's what you're missing in that scene. According to the law of Moses and the customs of the Jews at that time, all those pilgrims who came to Jerusalem for the Passover had to bring with them lambs because they had to sacrifice a lamb for Passover for every household. And so there were thousands upon thousands of lambs. Now, also according to the law of Israel, that the lamb had to live with the family for at least three days before it was sacrificed. So you couldn't bring it in the day before Passover. You had to bring it in several days before. And there were a lot of lambs because there were a lot of people. How many lambs? How many people? I'll tell you this. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus, he calculated, he counted in one year. It's not the same year that Jesus died, but it was a year of the same period. He calculated how many? 256,500 Passover lambs. Now, I, I will admit there's some scholars who look at that and go, well, Josephus is exaggerating. Okay, let's pretend, let's pretend he's doubling the real fi figure. Okay, it was only 125,000 lambs that had to be brought in the day Jesus entered or the next day. Friends, with that many lambs, they were coming in all day long, 24 hours a day almost. Do you realize that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, there were lambs everywhere coming into the city? What do you think that was like for Jesus? Oh, he hears the hosannas. He sees the palm branches waving. The palm branches were something like a, a patriotic symbol, going back to the time of the Maccabees and the Jewish liberation under them. He, he hears the cries, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He sees the children happy and dancing. He's riding on the donkey. He's doing all those. He gets it all, and then he sees everywhere around him lambs streaming into the city as well. And he says, they cheer for me now. But in a few days, I am the Lamb of God given for the sins of the world. And just like 
every lamb I see is going to die in a few days. So I will die. Now, Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, not as a lion, but as one of those lambs. And this is demonstrated by how he came in. He came in riding on a donkey, on a colt, a young donkey. Do you get what that means? He did that not only to fulfill prophecy because Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 says that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, but he also did it because he wanted to contrast himself with the way that a general might enter Jerusalem. A triumphal general would enter Jerusalem on a big white war horse, sword, shield, big impressive horse, or... A general might enter Jerusalem marching with his soldiers on foot. You know, there at the beginning of the big procession. He might enter it that way. Let me tell you how a general would not enter Jerusalem. On a donkey about this high, your feet almost touching the ground. Coming in on the kind of transportation that a businessman would use coming into a city. Because Jesus wanted to say, I'm coming to Jerusalem I'm coming as Messiah, I'm coming as king, but I am the king of peace. I'm not coming as a conquering general, at least not in the way that you think. So he comes into the city, and what happens? Look at verse 17. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The big crowd, because there's so many pilgrims coming into Jerusalem, the big crowd because they're so excited that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they look at all that and they go, we're losing. We set ourselves out to destroy this man, Jesus of Nazareth, and look, he's winning. I I love the phrase that it uses there. Did you catch that in verse 19? They look at one another and say, look, the the, the world is going after him. You're, You're accomplishing nothing. Isn't that a great phrase? They just look at each other and go, you guys are worthless. You're not even doing your job. You're accomplishing nothing in this work of trying to oppose Jesus. Now, friends, I like it when the enemies of Jesus feel like they're accomplishing nothing. And I like it when the opponents of Jesus feel like the whole world is going after Jesus and that Jesus is winning. Don't you like that? That's a good feeling, isn't it? I'm like, look, I want to be on Jesus' side. And therefore, when it looks like Jesus is winning, I get all charged up about that. Yes, Jesus, you're winning Yes, I love it. This is great. The whole world is going after you. Which John, recording the words of the religious leaders there, they spoke an unknowing prophecy because they were just using exaggeration. It wasn't the whole world. It was a few thousand people in Jerusalem. But John looks at that and sees it was a prophecy of how the whole world would go after Jesus later. Because friends, on this Sunday in the middle of June, uh, the year 2015, there's more than a billion people that name the name of Jesus Christ. There's millions upon millions upon millions of people all over this world worshiping Jesus Christ as Savior. The whole world has gone after Jesus and we're grateful for that. But This is what I want you to understand. I love this scene because it looks like Jesus is winning. But then I think that in just a few days, the same crowd that some of them said, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, some of those same people would be crying out, crucify him. I I realize that Jesus, even though he's being applauded and cheered by the crowd today, in just a few days after this, he's going to be on a cross. I realize that the religious leaders who thought that Jesus was winning and they were losing, in a few days, those religious leaders are going to spit in the face of Jesus and mock him as he hangs on the cross. Friends, no, make, make no mistake about it. On this day when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, it looks like he's winning. In a few days, it's going to look like he's losing. Now, I can get depressed 
or I can despair when I feel like Jesus and his cause is losing. It's easy to feel like that in the world today, isn't it? Do you uh, hear the news? Do you hear what's going on in the world today? Do you hear about the confusion there? Do you hear about the injustice? Do you hear about the perversion? Do you hear about the violence? Do you hear about the chaos? Do you hear about it ever? Friends, I hear it all, and I go, Jesus, where are you? What's going on? This, this thing is spiraling out of control. The world is going mad. Just like we studied last Wednesday as I'm teaching through the book of Jeremiah on Wednesday nights. It's like God has given the world a cup of judgment to drink. And the first thing that it does is it makes them crazy. And I look around, Lord, the world's going crazy. They're all going mad, Lord. What's going on here? And then I realize this. That even when it looked like Jesus was losing a few days after this, Friends, he was winning more than ever. Where did he win bigger than the cross? The cross was his greatest victory ever. It looked like he was losing at the cross. It looked like he had lost everything. But friends, he won everything for us at the cross. What I'm just trying to say, and I'll just leave you with this. It's very simple. We like it when Jesus wins, but we don't despair when it looks like he's losing. D- don't despair. Look, I love it when we get wins for Jesus, when people come to Christ, when people are healed, when people are filled with the Spirit of God, when sin is overcome, when addictions are broken. We go, yes, Lord, this is great. But friends, let me tell you something. I do not want you to despair, even if you think, man, God, where are you in this? Where are you in the world? Where are you in my personal life? What's going on around me? Don't you despair. Because even when it looks like Jesus might be losing its only appearance, Jesus always wins, and he'll find a way to pull out a glorious victory even in that. Father, that's my prayer. I pray, Lord, that um, you would help us to rejoice when it seems like the cause of Jesus is being glorified and going forward. But Lord, I pray also that you would help us to be filled with a lot of hope and a lot of faith, faith when it feels like the cause of Jesus is not winning. Because Jesus, we know you are the conqueror. You are the victor. You win it all, Lord. And we're very grateful for it. Pour out your spirit among us, Lord. I pray for everybody here this morning that you would bless them and anoint them and give them everything they need to live for you for another week. Do it, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon them in Jesus' name. Amen.